Well, still on Qantas and the Labor, Labor government's decision to block extra flights into Australia by Qatar Airways is under the microscope again today. After it was revealed, Anthony Albanese met with Alan Joyce just six weeks after that request from Qatar Airways. This is despite the Prime Minister's emphatic denials that he had not consulted with the former airline boss about the decision when grilled over the issue last year. Opposition leader Peter Dutton is calling on the Prime Minister to explain himself. So for 16 months he's fought against this information being released. It turns out that he did meet with Alan Joyce. Now, I don't know whether he's misled the Parliament or not, uh, but I think there are some serious questions for the Prime Minister to answer here because it, 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 the decision has had a direct negative effect uh, on the travelling public and the Prime Minister, uh, it appears, has met with the CEO uh, who surely would have lobbied on this issue on behalf of his company. Well, joining me now to discuss that and more is Liberal MP Garth Hamilton. Garth, thank you for coming on the program tonight. It's no surprises that Mr Anthony Alb Albanese has once again not been transparent with the Australian people. How many chances does he get? Well, he was getting quite a few chances in his honeymoon period. Now, the first 12 months of his term were wonderful in the papers, but bit by bit we're seeing the cracks come through and this one could not be clearer. I mean, goodness me, he's had every chance to come clean on this multiple times. Instead, he's done the opposite. And uh, Peter Dutton's right. I think he has misled the parliament. I think he's misled the Australian people by saying he wasn't lobbied. Uh, I find that very hard to believe. And why he wouldn't have just raised that he met with Mr Joyce during this period when it's clearly uh, material to the conversation that we've been having about the access that uh, Qantas has had with the Labor Party. But, you know, we've seen this all last year. Uh, you know, Labor very, very closely in bed with the elites, uh, with the boardrooms around Australia, very, very tight. And uh, I think it raises some questions for a lot of Australians who are going through some pretty tough times. Why don't they get the same treatment as Mr Joyce got? Well, if the government was hoping this issue would go away over the summer holidays, uh, that certainly turned out not to be the case. And another issue that they probably hoped to be able to sweep under the rug, it's been revealed this week that two more of the detainees who were free during the controversial High Court ruling have been rearrested, bringing the total number to seven. How much longer can the Prime Minister protect his home affairs and immigration ministers over this debacle? Well, I think a lot of people were expecting a reshuffle over summer to see Claire O'Neill politely hidden away after her terrible attempt at it, being a minister uh, and the debacles that she's seen in her, uh, you know, under her reign. Uh, but look, do you remember when Labor made such a big deal about the tough preventative detention laws that they were bringing in at the end of last year and how they were every bit as tough as Peter Dutton when it came to national security? Well, they haven't used those laws since. And I think we're seeing now this, this continuing, uh, you know, involvement of this case with more and more people being arrested, having been released. The truth is they were dragged to the table bringing those laws in and they don't want to use them. They, they simply don't. Uh, their instincts are to, to look after the people who are committing these crimes, not the potential victims of them. So they're not putting Australia's interests first. And I, I think this will just continue to play out piece by piece. It's going to continue to be damaging for Mr Albanese, how long Claire O'Neill can keep her job? Goodness me, what a protected species. Well, we'll see if that reshuffle ends up eventuating. It certainly hasn't happened yet. But, look, this all comes as it's been revealed. Australia is fielding a record number of asylum seeker applications, 2,000 each month. Now, that's double that of before the election. And the long processing times are seeing many look for loopholes to get into the country. Immigration Minister Andrew Giles lays the blame squarely with the former government. Is that fair? Uh, look, it's, they're one-trick ponies. It's the only thing they say. When anything goes wrong under this Labor government, they, they try to convince people that this is somehow someone else's fault. Uh, they've yet to take responsibility for anything. Goodness me, what we're seeing is record numbers of people coming through from conflict-free nations. Uh, so, so this is putting incredible pressure on our system, uh, genuine refugees, and I think it's important that Australia does play its part uh, to, to look after um, genuine refugees, and we have. We've got a long and proud tradition of doing that. But when we see these sort of numbers come through under Andrew Giles, and, and I'll just pause because I had a crack at Claire O'Neill, I think he's been every bit as terrible uh, as her, and, and hopefully that great reshuffle does come and sweep him away into the next corner of the Labor uh, memory banks. 
But uh, look, this is happening under his reign. This is causing strain on people and it's reducing our ability to do the things that we want to do as Australians by playing our part uh, for looking after genuine refugees. Well, let's move on now. And Anthony Albanese has launched a review into the missing Iraq war documents, which were supposed to be made available to the public on New Year's Day. Thought we had a soundbite there, but uh, what... He's obsessing about uh, trying to get square with John Howard over the release of these papers, cabinet papers, which is a beltway issue that papers should be released, but that's an issue for the bureaucrats to work out. We have a new guest on the program tonight, Barnaby Joyce. Welcome and thank you so much for being able to join us. Uh, I might get your response uh, to that, those suggestions that there had been some kind of cover-up by the Morrison government in relation to these documents. A load of rubbish. It, it rests with the archives. It doesn't rest with the Prime Minister. Um, and it doesn't rest, certainly doesn't rest with the Leader of the Opposition. And it most definitely doesn't rest with previous Prime Ministers. What? But how, look, focusing on this, how's that going to help, help the cost of living? How does that bring down the price of power? And what, what a massive distraction. I'm sure in due course, all these documents will be released. They're not, unless they've lost them, I, I've got no idea. That's a question for the archives. But what I do know is a lot of people will say, okay, great. For history students, a marvellous a marvelous adventure. But if I'm trying to pay for my power bill or pay for my groceries or pay for the, you know, make the house payments, that's not going to help me. And what I want is a government that focuses on the, the things that are before us now, not constitutional change, climate change or the, or the national archives, which seems to be their forte. The Prime Minister did start off the year saying that that would be his focus, the cost of living. So you have a point. I don't know how that's going to help petrol prices. But look, I want to get uh, your view, Barnaby. I know you've called out the government this week for its inaction on uh, veteran reform. Can you fill us in on that? OK. For your listeners, most people who've served in the Defence Force will understand this. There are three acts, and they go by the acronym Dirk and Merker and VEA, Veterans Entitlement Act. So one is a Rehabilitation Act, one is the Military Rehabilitation Act, so um, and the Defence Act. So these, this was recommendation number one of the Royal Commission, right? Number one. And the Royal Commission said by the 22nd of December. So today we are on, what, on the 4th, are we? So the 4th. So the 22nd of December, this was supposed to be, the, the draft of this was supposed to be tabled. And we haven't seen sight nor sound of it, nor have we seen an explanation as why. And if you're not in the Defence Force, and just see it this way, this is the fundamentals of government. You, if you're giving an order, if you're given a promise, if you give a promise, you meet it. Otherwise, you're incompetent. And you're especially incompetent when you can't even give an explanation about why this, why this document, which so many people in the Defence Force want to see, because, see, they're on different entitlements. Some, they get different amounts of money and they want to see where their entitlements end up in this new draft of legislation that is before them. And, uh, you know, we're still waiting. Uh, they don't... The, the first thing they did with the Defence Force is kick the Minister for Veterans Affairs out of the Cabinet. That's about the most... That's the most substantial thing they've done for veterans thus far. And, um, you know, veterans are, are getting kind of sick of this. So, so we go back into Parliament in about a month's time and it's only fair that veterans have a, a right to, and their you know, RSL clubs and other representative bodies have a right to peruse this um, draft of the legislation to get back to their members about you know how they see it. Well, our veterans certainly deserve better. Perhaps the government's hoping no one's really paying attention over that Christmas period, but. Barnaby Joyce, you're right onto it. Uh, Garth, I'll bring you back in now. A poll has revealed how our independent MPs are voting and shock horror, it's with Labor. Well, do you remember when they campaigned on integrity? They campaigned on integrity. It was so important that everyone had this great integrity and they said they were independents. Well, oh my goodness, who would have suspected they're actually Labor independents? When you vote over 70% in alignment with Labor, you are effectively a Labor uh, independent. That's what you are. And, and they've all been found out to be exactly doing this. Uh, there's no great discrepancy. Every one of these deals is lockstep in with the Labor Party, particularly on the big issues that matter. Uh, and I think this is important for the Australian people to realise because we found out in the election, vote teal, you get Labor. That's not just when it comes to the government. That's also when it comes to the policies that that government then enacts. Uh, the teals have been right beside everything this Labor government has done. 
And I think they should own up to that if, if integrity is still important to them. Barnaby, it's hardly surprising, is it? We, we know where a lot of these independence loyalties lie. Oh, and they'll become independent again. Don't worry, Garth. They'll become independent, mate, about two months before the election. Uh, and then they'll be, oh, you know, we're all horribly horrible people. The main parties are horrible people. They'll be the lights of virtue. They'll go to the electorate saying, oh, you know, I am the, hold the balance of power and I'll hold them to account. And then after the next election, folks, they go back to voting for Labor. It's very much like Tony Windsor and Rob Oakeshott. They were the first of them. But I'll tell you where the trouble happens for them is if there's a hung parliament. Because it, no matter how um, nouveau their electorates are, the one thing they don't want is a Labor government because the Labor government's tax high and interfere with the ownership of your assets, your super funds. We've seen that just lately. And if they're responsible for putting in a Labor government, they can just go, boop, that's the end of their career. Just rule a line under it. It's all over. So let's see how they go. Yeah, that, that's a good point. So it'll be interesting to see if that eventuates. Look, finally, while one of Anthony Albanese's pre-election promises was to make Parliament more respectful, new data has revealed federal MPs have been booted out 118 times from question time since the election. Now, the majority of those were from the opposition. And congratulations, Garth, you've come in second place, being kicked out nine times. Congratulations. Do you have any regrets? Not a single regret. I continue to go down there and fight passionately for things that I believe in. And I'll point out, I only raise my voice when the government's either being misleading or refusing to answer a question. So if they start doing their job and taking their responsibilities seriously in question time, which is allowing themselves to face scrutiny, then I'll have nothing to interject with. Uh, but the reality is, and anyone who's watched question time will know, this government has skirted any um, responsibility of you know, being held to account for their actions. And I don't think they're going to change in any way whatsoever. So, look, I'm probably going to have a few more strepsils and keep the voice uh, limber for the next year. You better go home and relax it after this. Barnaby, have you got some catching up to do? Um, I've never been kicked out <laughs> in 18 years. So um, uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a wooden desk beside me. Touch wood, touch wood. I always keep a very close eye on the speaker. And um, once he looks my way and gives a sign that the next, te next test of his patience is history for me, I shut up. Well, maybe you and Garth need to get, get together and you can impart some of your tips uh, on how to avoid that, although it doesn't seem that Garth is keen to. Uh, Barnaby Joyce and Garth Hamilton, thank you both so much for your time.